So uh, is, I'm, I'm glad I, I, I got to see David's chat today because uh, David's talk, there's a lot of, he's talking about simple systems and, and how to you know, achieve your goals and, and, and what tends to happen when we are trying to be more productive is we get caught up in all of the tools and all the shiny tech and all the, like all the complicated systems, the overwrought systems, the systems that we're often uh, you know, forced to use in larger corporations or businesses or whatnot, uh, Microsoft Project, and uh, you know, things like that. <laughs> so we end up kind of just going through the motions. And what we end up doing is we end up doing productive instead of being productive. Uh, how many of you follow the site Lifehacker? Just about. Okay. Uh, how many of you uh, ha were following Lifehacker at one point and then decided that when they started to post things like uh, put lettuce underneath your hamburger to make, yeah, there we go. So what happens is we have, we have a, a thing that's happened now with so much coming at us all the time uh, that we are starting to hack life to death with all these simple things that really are common sense. Putting lettuce underneath a hamburger to make sure that your bun doesn't get soggy isn't really a life hack, yes. <laughs> but it gets page views, you know? Taking the, by the way, all of you that got the, the hipster PDAs from David, you could take those binder clips off, and when you're using your toothpaste, you can use that to keep the toothpaste. No. Yes! <laughs> there you go. Yeah, post that. <laughs> Get that one down. That's your, role, that's your role as a shopper, to know that. <laughs> But here's the thing, is that we have so much going on that, I mean, how many of you follow David Allen and know who David Allen is, getting, author of Getting Things Done? A methodology that, w at first blush, when you read it, you're like, oh my god, this is too complex, I'm going to put it away. But then the more you read it, the more you're like, okay, well, this, this, maybe I can get this. In fact, I've read the book probably mm, half a dozen times at this point. Every time I read it, I get something different out of it. We're going to talk a little bit about the different things you can get out of that. But one of his, one of his most uh, prominent quotes is, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And yet we try, right? We try to get through our email inbox every single day, uh, which is ridiculous. Uh, we try to check off as many boxes as possible because quantifying productivity is a hell of a lot easier than qualifying it, right? We end up spending time just, if we get 300 things done during the day, but they're all the wrong things, then did we really do the right thing? So what, what doing productive is, as opposed to uh, being productive, is doing productive is checking off as much as possible. Being productive is checking off the right things, checking off the right boxes. How many of you are busy? <laughs> busy, how many of you? Okay, how many of you said you were busy until you realized that busy is like the word f It loses its power the more you say it, right? By the time I started swearing here, you guys, yeah, we've heard that before. It's not really as, yeah, it was done, this has been done. Busy, the word busy, we're all busy. We're all busy. So saying you're busy is, is, is powerless in a lot of ways because we all, have, we all have different levels of busy. So everyone is busy. Thing is, what are you busy with? What are you busy for? Are you doing the right things or are you just doing busy work, right? And it's very easy, it's very simple to do that stuff because it's very, we're directed down that path. How many of you check email first thing in the morning just by raising your hands? Because it's Pavlovian, right? I don't know what to do. I'm going to get up and, oh, email told me. I need to go and uh, file this report or do this thing. Email tells you what to do, whereas maybe if you looked at the day before and saw what you needed to do and checked your plan, right, looked at your, your goals and looked at your roles, looked at your responsibilities, looked at your task list that you maintain, maybe email would maybe have a little bit less import. But you can get to Inbox Zero, right? I want to talk about Inbox Zero actually a little bit. But how do we get, how do we stop doing productive and start being productive? Well, first off, this is not so simple. We have to take time in order to make time. We have to slow down. As we were coming back from lunch today, um, I was talking with Robin, who's he's not here anymore. We were talking about we have so much stuff coming at us all the time. And that's by design. We can't critically think if we're trying to inhale and ingest all this stuff. So we just do. We just do. We just go. Right? 
But then we run out of gas, right? We run out of gas for the things that we really should be f focusing on, the things we should pay attention to. That's when things like fear come into play, right? Because we're spending so much time taking everything in that all of a sudden when something you know, uh, important comes along, we're afraid, well, we don't have time to deal with that. I'm afraid I'm out of time. Uh, what if I do that and I miss something? What if I, that fear of missing out? Was FOMO a thing 10 years ago? Really? And YOLO and all these acronyms? FOMO, fear of missing out? We don't, guess what? Technology allows us to not miss out if we don't want to, right? I mean, some people that are not, are not here right now, people who you know, want to see a lot of the videos that are going to be from, from Simple Rep, they can see them later. Fear of missing out is, is kind of a thing that we, we're, we're focused on, you know? So fear can, can happen when we, we just keep going and going and going. So you need to take the time to make the time, all right? <clears throat> and how do we do that? One of the ways we do that is we, instead of focusing on all the apps that we have, all the shiny <coughs> tech, all the Evernotes and the to-do apps and the calendar apps and everything is, is going to get a bit... I know you like this, this the quote, Joel. Focus on the app within. This is about as deep as I get. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, the approach that we take to our day, to our week, to our lives, to our work, is far, far more important than the apps that we use. Because if we take an approach that isn't our own, that doesn't work for us, that isn't going to help us do the right things and be productive, then it's really, the app's not going to help us. The app is only going to take us so far. You know, Patrick and I, Patrick and I used OmniFocus. You still use OmniFocus, don't you, Patrick? No, you don't. Right, because it's 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 big, it's unwieldy. You use it though, right, Brooks? I'm a big guy. What can you say? <laughs> <laughs> OmniFocus is a great big task manager. On how many of you heard of it? Just by yeah. So it's 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 big and it's kind of expensive. But I mean, you get you get what you pay for. You get a lot of value out of it. I was an OmniFocus user for years and still love this stuff. Right, but if what would happen is people would go into that app and they would throw everything at it. Everything that was coming into them, they would throw at this app. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if it matters to them or not. And then they go into the app and they go, whoa. I'll just go back to email. <laughs> it's easier. I don't have to make a decision then. Because someone else is telling me what to do. So some people are going to want to use, you know, Dave, David's got, you know, we're talking about the, the, the system that David uses, the simple, simple systems. And it is, there's things that we can do that will support our workflow, support what we want to do and how we work versus what is being, we're being directed towards. Things like email to manage our tasks, which is not simple at all. So we need to focus on the app. And the reason, why is there a snowflake there? That's probably why, you know, because it doesn't snow where I am in Canada, actually. I'm like Brooks, you know, we're in the West Coast where we get snow twice. I actually used a hockey stick when it snowed the first time. I got rid of it, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's true, it's true. Brooms don't work. The snow is kind of wet on the island. Um, but <laughs> but the, the thing about a snowflake is a snowflake, no one snowflake is the same, right? Every snowflake is different. So... Your needs are going to be different than the, the person that's next to you needs. It's all going to be different. Everything is subjective when it comes to workflow, when it comes to how you're going to get your work done. So is simplicity, really. Simplicity is subjective in a lot of ways. What's simple to some might not be simple to somebody else. <clears throat> Twitter, so um, it was it, uh, Ethan, you were, you were showing uh, um, Robin how to use Twitter, right? Uh, today at lunch. How easy is that for you? Simple? Really? Yeah. Yeah. You add it, it's down. Yeah. But for some people, it's not, right? They need that. For some people, using paper, not so simple, right, Brooks? <laughs> <laughs> but simplicity is subjective, and, and so are the tools that we can use to get our work done. So don't feel that if you're trying to figure out how to get more of the, the right stuff done, spend some time looking at your approach first. Don't just jump on the shiniest new tech. Patrick, I don't know if he's going to talk about this, but he has a post called Sensible Defaults. It's on, an, it's on enough, isn't it? Isn't that, is well, it? actually, yeah. Yes, it's actually Patrick. 
Okay, it's that patchwork. But it's Google sensible. 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 Yeah. There's a lot of people who, when you Google their thing, that they say that it's going to be at the top of the list. Uh, <laughs> but since when you get a new, a shiny new device, right? Everything is on by default. Mm -hmm. Everything is on. Notifications, a ringtone you don't like. You know the apps you'll never use. I haven't. <laughs> I have a folder on my iPhone called "Not Using." <laughs> And it's got all of my, the Apple stock apps, including the Apple's stock app, <laughs> in that folder, right? But what happens when we get the sh shiny new device? Unless you're in Australia where you drop it, if you're first in line to get the iPhone 6, what do the rest of us do when, when we get we, we just take it at face value. We're like, you know, okay, well, it's on. There we go. Some people will take the time to actually, you know, move things around. And, but generally, we let notifications happen. We let the apps that sit there happen. We just say, okay, well, this is what they gave us. They should know us better than, I mean, it's their thing. But as soon as it passes on to you, it's like a, any creation you make, right? Anything you create, as soon as you pass it out into the world, it's no longer yours. It can be co-opted, right? How many of you love Creative Commons work? I know I do. A lot of these images are Creative Commons. Creative Commons is great because when I send something out of the world, it can be modified and changed, and in some ways made better. I know that some of the paper-based systems that are out there right now, Dash Plus, which is Patrick's, the Bullet Journal, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, they've been modified and made better and made different for different people. When you put something out there, it could be co-opted, which is fine, right? But the problem is when you take something and it becomes co-opted, right? And say you've got this device, and you're like, okay, well, this is, this is what they want. This is what they're giving me. I'm going to take it without really making it my own. All of a sudden, this device can become corrupted. Not corrupted in the sake of it's going to break or anything like that, but it can cause you to break. It can cause your attention to break. It can cause you to focus on the wrong things. How many of you um, use the airplane mode any time that you are in a meeting? or having a coffee, or maybe just because you don't want to be bothered. Sometimes or every time? I'm not saying every time. Come on, that's extreme. <coughs> this is simple, not extreme. <laughs> um, it's the most productive button on your phone. No one thinks about it that way initially, because it's for airplanes. It says airplane mode. Why would I use it on a train? You know, or why would I use it when I'm having a meeting? And actually, to put it in the airplane was a lot cheaper than doing the whole phone stack game where everyone piles their phones on one another and you reach for it. If you put it in airplane mode and play that game, you know your phone's not going to go off, so you have a better chance of winning. <laughs> That's a life hack. Um, <laughs> so, what happens when we start focusing on all the things that are coming our way, when we let others dictate? how we're going to spend our time, how we're going to be productive, whether it's through a device or whether it's through uh, a platform such as email, is we largely wind up focusing, like I said, on quantity over quality. And I mean, unless you're a lemon uh, delivery person or a lemon grocer, then quantity isn't really what you want, right? You want your quality, you're, you're focusing, you want to make sure that you have this, you want quality to be the focus of what you're doing over quantity, because that's where the gold lies, right? That's where things really can, can happen for you. Starbucks. Don't worry, I'm not going to say it's quality. I'm just saying Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> Starbucks, uh, I, was at, uh, I was in New York the uh, past couple days, and uh, we don't get uh, some of the ESPN stations up in Canada. Um, I don't know, there's what, 38 of them, I think. So we only get like three. Uh, <laughs> and I was watching Colin Cowherd do his thing. I guess he's their resident, like, Blowhard? Would that be the right term? <laughs> anyway, so he's talking about Starbucks, and he says that Starbucks are going to open more locations because lineups are getting too long. They're 20 minutes long, the average lineup they're saying in Starbucks. And he was amazed by this, and he talked to a financial fr analyst friend of his, and he said they're going about this the wrong way. The reason the lineups are 20 minutes long is not because it's busy. It's because the baristas behind the counter have so many more things to memorize on how to make and what to deliver and do all that stuff that they can't keep up. They're overtaxed. They're overwrought. And 
I'm no barista, and I'm, I mean, I love my coffee, but I know that it takes me a hell of a lot less time to walk into a Starbucks than it does to make a latte. Like, it's, it's just, you know. So what they're doing is they're going to open more stores so that there's less lineups. So more will may, may make less, basically. They'll, but the problem is, is we've seen this happen before. We saw this when Target came to Canada. Target misjudged. Target said, we're going to expand into Canada. Everybody loves Target, except they bought a beloved Canadian department store, and that was stuck in Canada's craw a little bit. And then the prices aren't the same. It's more expensive. So they're not, and people don't shop the same in Canada as they do in the United States. There's just some subtle differences. Subtle enough that Target had to make some significant changes, and they're actually even considering about pulling out of Canada altogether now. Yeah, that was tragic. <laughs> we'll take Trader Joe's, though. <laughs> I like Trader Joe's. Let's do that. So Starbucks is sitting here going, you know, let's do that. What's, what's going to happen? Maybe, maybe, it'll ha maybe they'll make more money. But they're going to spend a lot of money to make more money. Maybe the lineups won't be as long. But the solution, maybe, is to make less stuff and make it better. Right? There's one company that does this pretty well. Who is the Heyo? Who did that? Yeah. You work for Costco? I love Costco. See, I used to work for Costco. I don't work for them. I just love them. You just love them? <laughs> Who doesn't love them? No, I'm, I don't want ever say, I don't like Costco. <laughs> I go in there and spend, for milk and butter and spend 500 bucks. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> so Costco, I worked for Costco for 12 years. It's a long time. But they were a great company. I enjoyed working for them. Uh, but it's, brought, brought, yeah, it's what brought me out west. But Costco does things a little bit differently. When you go into Costco to buy coffee, let's say, actually let's use ketchup as an example. How many types of ketchup can you buy at Costco? One, one. one or two. And normally it's like the one big can of Heinz or the six pack of, of Heinz. And that's about <laughs> it, right? So what they've done is basically by eliminating choice, They've eliminated that paradox problem that comes with choice. They've, el they've eliminated paralysis by analysis, which means people go into Costco and they're like, okay, I gotta get some ketchup. Okay, well, this is the ketchup I can get. Oh, this is the milk I can get. This is the other. So they're able to shop and get out. $500 later, of course. <laughs> but they still are able to do that. And they don't spend money on the frills. You're not gonna go in there and see, like, you know, a marble pillars and you know I mean they use girders and steel and pallets and printed signs and their inner and their systems are basically like old intranet that you know I the Commodore pets I think they're using there or whatever like it's, it's ridiculous but that's not where their focus is their focus is on getting more value to their members so that they can get in get out and get what they need now the other bit probably you don't know that they're in another line of business as well because they focus on that core business they don't really spend a lot of time like with a bunch of different vendors and stuff. So they're able to actually <coughs> branch off into different businesses. Real estate is one of them. So during my time at Costco, I got a little inside information. Costco buys properties that they have no intention of ever building on. So what they'll do is they'll buy large parcels of land and then they'll leak it out. Hey, you know, Costco bought some land and you know, Flin Flon. So no one knows where, you know where Flin Flon is. <laughs> it is named after a fictional character from a novel, I'll have you know, named wow. Flintavetti Flanagan. That is a true fact. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 that was the, it, see when I asked you to when I asked you as the plant, I didn't expect all that the, the context. There, but good job. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll buy a whole bunch of land, and then what'll happen is McDonald's will hear about it, and Starbucks will hear about it, and Applebee's, and all these, and they'll start building stuff there, and then Costco will go, okay, we're selling it, and the property of the value of the land goes up, and they make money. By the way, Costco also makes way more money off toilet paper than anybody else. And they also sell, I think they sell like 300,000 pallets of it before they even have to pay for one of them because they do things on net 30 days. So they make money off their interest because they're focused. At Costco, when you go in there, less is truly more, right? Less is more. 
So they're doing things a little bit right. They're focusing on the right things so they can treat their customers right. And yes, they charge their customers, and maybe that's why some people don't like Costco, but that helps them keep their prices down. So they've got their business model straight down. They can think outside the box, or if you'll pardon the pun, the big box. <laughs> so quality over quantity. When you start to do that, that's when you're really being productive. When you start to align, as David was saying, your roles with, your, with, your, with what really matters to you, with your tasks and your time, you're able to move things forward. So how do we really manage time? Because time is hard to manage. Time is big. Time has 18 different definitions, and it's just as a noun. Time is also plural and singular. Right? Tasks. Tasks is plural. Task is singular. It's easy to wrap your head around a task. When you say, hey, can you do this for me? Sure. Whatever that this is. Hey, can you, can you do this, work around this time frame for me? It gives you a lot more latitude. It's harder to wrangle that stuff. So when you're focusing on managing your time, don't worry about the clock nearly as much as you do. Because the clock's moving whether you want it to or not. As we can see, it's moving. So managing time it means managing you and your energy. That vital, you're talking about vitality and stuff like that. But energy. Most people don't, they, they don't take the time to think about that until it's too late, until they're dead tired. Or when they wake up in the morning and they're tired and then they go into email. And then the email, moving along the email and then the day, end of the day is done. You're like, oh, I'm time for me to write my book. And that one sentence never happens. <laughs> or it happens two weeks later, right? Here's the one sentence, sorry. One, I don't know. Oh, the, the 10,000 books never. 10,000 years. 10,000 books? Could 10, be 10,000 books. Yeah, could be 10,000 books. So that's really only 5,000 okay. people. 10, We're aiming a little low, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Do the math again. Yeah. Some pro wrestlers in there, maybe there's a few because they've lost their energy. <laughs> so managing time means managing you and your energy. All right? And there's ways to do that. Okay? But this is not one of them. The email problem is huge. And that's what a, a lot of you are. How many of you have. Uh, uh, I just want everyone to start. We're going to do a little exercise here. Um, I want you to write down on the hipster PDA that was handed out because you still have some, should have some cards left. You should have some cards left. You're not called, what do you call it? Is it the hipster PDA for you as well? Uh, it's called the simple system for everything. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> <laughs> so on your uh, SSE, SS, you SSFE, because um, in Canada we actually use the prepositions for acronyms. I don't know if you know that. Um, write down how many emails you think you have in your inbox right now. Unread? Unread. Just it, no emails in your inbox. Doesn't matter if they're unread or not. Nice try though. How many emails are in your inbox right now? Just write it down. I'll give you. I'm not going to give you 30 seconds. That's a long time up here. It's been in your email inbox. If you have multiple emails. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but just pick one inbox and do it. Does that count the junk that my helper has missed since I've been in here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. You need more time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, I'm in a shame spiral. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, Dan, okay. I'm going to ask you to volunteer first and tell me how many are in your inbox. I'm right? going to guess 261. That's not bad. That's not bad. I've heard worse. So, so this is the number that I take a lot of pride in. Uh huh. So, um, I love <laughs> the pre. -cre I, well, I, I created this email account. I would say about ten years ago. Okay. I have never deleted a single email. Oh. Well, that's good. You're all or nothing. I gotta respect that. <laughs> I gotta respect that. I don't know because I actually haven't looked at the number in a while, but I would guess seventeen thousand five hundred. Sure. The funny thing is, I've heard a higher number from people who have that active email and are using it. So what do you have? I wrote 20. That's good. I recently did what Leo Boboda says to once a week. Email, email bankruptcy? No mail. Yeah. But not that many people like me or email me. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a that's a nice problem to have. All right, let's get uh, anyone else want to ball. Anyone else can beat the seventeen thousand is pretty high, but go ahead. I can do it on the other side. I think I've got one or zero. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Anyone else want to volunteer their number? Yeah. Probably at work every eight hundred. Eight hundred. Okay. So here's the thing about email, is that that inbox zero thing that, and we're gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about inbox zero. Merlin Mann coined that term. And everyone assumed after hearing it, because it was again co-opted and then corrupted, that it meant get your email to zero and you're productive. That's really what's happened. 
Mm, that's not what he meant at all. <laughs> he meant like get get your head clear. You know, like that David Allen mind like water stuff. Inbox Zero is more about a mental bandwidth clearing than an email clearing. So the problem with email isn't the platform, right? Because what was email meant to replace? Anyone? Mail. Mail. Snail mail. So how many times do you check your postal mailbox per day? <laughs> once, right? How many, okay, how many do you check your email once per day? Raise your hand. <laughs> I love that. That was awesome. Oh. The way you look, it was like, doesn't everybody? <laughs> on your face. And everyone's like looking at you like, oh my god. <laughs> All right. So that, that's the thing is when people, normally we don't get the, I don't get that response. And normally the response is when I say check uh, post them, I'm like, oh, I know where he's going with this. And then, then I don't get this one. That's crazy. <laughs> so the thing is, is that email was meant to replace letter mail. And really, what happened was it showed up before text messaging and instant messaging and all that stuff. And man, I wished it was the other way around because if DMing showed up first, then people would say, hey, I know how to reach you really quickly. You've got my number. Blah. But no, what happened was email came first and we say, like, hey, I'm going to email you. And then we get these, hey, happy Monday emails. And then the thanks for that report. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for, th really, thanks. I appreciate it. No problem. We'll see you on Monday. Yeah, what are you doing on Monday? And it becomes this, all of a sudden your inbox is teeming with 17,500 emails, you know, about some kind of innocuous conversation that doesn't really need to happen over email. The problem is we, need, we don't set up boundaries with email now. And now it's harder to. Because once you start setting boundaries with email, like Patrick I know has done, I've done, I don't know how many of you have said I don't answer email after a certain period of time. I'm sure most of you get to that point. Some of you have. If you're at inbox one or zero, you must have gotten to the point where you said, hey, you know what? I only answer email after, after a certain period of day. I'm not going to answer it anymore. And I'll just deal with it the next day. Would that be about correct or no? You or do you just like, uh, a new email coming? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I have this strategy where I just like, you know, I look at the whole list and like I, I put, I push the button that mm -hmm. you know that it selects them. Yep. And I look down through the whole thing. And I can tell that probably about one in a hundred is actually anything I need to do anything with, and all the rest just get deleted delete. instantly. Yep. Yeah. So yep. then I've got that one to go back to, and I look at it and it's either something I need to deal with right then or. So you've systemized it, which a lot of people haven't done because they just wait till it's overflowing and they're like, I don't know what to do with it. So they leave it sitting in their inbox, which is what people said. What do you mean? I mean everything? One inbox? Or what about the five inboxes that I have? What about the stuff? Then it starts taking up a lot of the mental bandwidth because then you're thinking about all the things you need to do and, uh -huh. then, and then you can't respond appropriately. That's when you, know, you become the person that nobody likes because you don't respond to their email. See, and wouldn't you rather be the person nobody likes because you say, hey, guess what? I don't answer email after 5 p.m. I'll get you back to you tomorrow. Yeah. I'd rather be that person that I wasn't, because that, that, at least then they're show, you're setting a boundary. Because if you don't set boundaries, then others will. And further to that, if you set boundaries and don't respect them, how can you respect, expect anybody else to? The other problem with email isn't just the sender, it's the receiver, right? It's, it works both ways. For example, if I write, respond to an email at 2 a.m. that somebody sent me at, 11 at night, that's not just the email message that's in there. When you get an email, it says the subject line, and then it says the date and time. As soon as, if someone, and they subconsciously see this, oh, Mike responds to email at 2 a.m. <laughs> so now all of a sudden there's an expectation. The boundary has been shifted. Hmm? Exactly. Exactly. It's a total precedent. And it's very, very subconscious because we all see the date in our email, right? Like it, every single email application I've come across has the date there and the time in a lot of cases. So you'll see it and you'll know. And then when you don't respond that time at 2 a.m., what's with Mike? He normally, does, maybe he's responding to other people at 2 a.m. I live on the West Coast, so it's a little bit different. But the point is, is that email, the problem is the user. It's not the platform. So we need to set boundaries with email. And we need to set aside the right amount of time to do email and not leave it open all the time. How many of you have notifications for email on on your phone? You're smiling. You do, right? It's like, yeah, who doesn't? You looked exactly like <laughs> Yeah. What? Uh, there's a service, and I'm going to give it all, uh, the, the name of it, uh, it's called Awayfind, awayfind.com. And it's very, it's, it's, it's one of these set it and forget it kind of things, where you set it, and you say, hey, thanks for emailing me, 
and it's got some intelligent auto responding involved where it will say, hey, you know what, thanks for your email, and you could customize this how you want. Uh, I only check email two to three times per day. If this is really important, click on this link, and that'll send them to a contact form. They can fill that out, and then you'll get a notification, which means they jump through the extra hoop to email you, which is kind of nice. It means that they're going to think twice about bugging you because, well, it's really not all that important. It was just the hello, happy Monday email. I really don't need to send. And then it'll say, if not, then I'll respond to your email within X amount of time. So it's it really an intelligent auto-responding service, and it's, it's fantastic. So the reason I like those kind of services in terms of making things simpler for you Kind of like how Joshua outsourced part of his talk this morning. Because <laughs> if he did bad, if you did bad, then he'd be like, hey, not on me, man. I'm just standing over here. It removes you from the equation a bit. Because no, you don't, how, how, I don't like to say no. I don't want to be that guy necessarily. So I let the service be that guy. I put a barrier, put a, a bit of a shield, right? It's the same thing I do with scheduling. There's a service called Schedule Once that I use. There you go. Or if somebody wants to schedule something with me, we don't do the, hey, how's five in the morning on Monday? No, oh, I can't do that. How about Tuesday? You don't do the back and forth email dance trying to figure out a time. You say, here's my link. And I have a text expander snippet where it says, here's the link. And I explain in the snippet, look, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I don't say it exactly like that. <laughs> but I don't want to accidentally double book. I'm trying to be conscious of both of us. So please click on this link and then pick three times and then I'll pick the whatever one works for both of us and boom, we're all set, right? Because right now, the way email is set up is it's, it's a I, it's an importance thing. It's important to me. Why didn't that person get back to me right away? You know, I need a response. It's all I, 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 me, me, me. So when you send a response, if you want to set up boundaries, make it about both of you. So say, hey, you know what? Our time is important to us. I don't want us to screw up this and miss an appointment. I want to make sure that I respond to you in a timely manner. Make it more about both of you, because it really is on the other side of the equation about them, right? So that's how we tackle the email problem. I already touched on inbox there, go ahead. The one thing that I got, it, I love the service too, the one thing that kind of sucks is when you're the one who doesn't, that, that don't use it, Case in point, when the three of us were getting back together to podcast, mm. it's like, well, I had to go to yours, I had to go to yours, I'm the one stuck doing all the work, and that was like, or else we all three use it, and it's like, well, you click on my link, you click on my link. <laughs> you know what? And I'm in a shame spiral, and I was like, well, I gotta do it. When we get to, you know what? I would rather be at that problem than the other problem, but you're right. Shoot yeah, that, it yeah. does, at that point, if someone's using the service, then someone should take the ball and run with it, yeah. but you're right, you're right. Um, if, if, yeah. I, if I could also just say one thing. Um, I've, I've like started to try and like put my foot in, into that realm of like putting up some of those barriers. Um, and I've stepped back because what I noticed was that the people who were reaching out to me got the sense that I was more important than they were, or that, that essentially that was the message I was communicating. Like my time is more important than your time. What did you put in the community? What did you put when you put the service up? It's um, all in, because you can customize these messages. Right, right, right. And I think like that's a little bit of where it lies. Is it's that time. front end work. You need to be very, con we, like all of this stuff, about be mindful, being aware, saying, you know, that critical thinking. Because what most people do when they set these things up is they do the same thing when they're answering email or when they're trying to, uh, I got to get this set up quick and get it out of, get out of here. It's not, you're basically, think about it as baking a souffle. You don't want it to collapse. You want to make sure it stays, you know, nice. You don't want it to fall, right? So if you want that relationship to work, first off, and also pick your spots. A way find, you can say, hey, anyone who emails me from this email address bypasses it. My wife does not get away find messages from me. <laughs> She's on the VIP list. It comes right to me, right? And the thing is, is that honestly, I'd love to train my wife to be able to use like text messaging and stuff. But I know better than that. <laughs> I've been married for 10 years for nothing. I know that I, there's only, you gotta pick your battles. That's not one I'm willing to pick. Um, so yeah, you need to be very, again, mindful. Put yourself in the other person's shoes, because chances are, they probably would love to know about a service like that. But when you say, yeah, you know what? Uh, I only answer email two to three times per day. Click on this link to get through to me, thanks. That's like, mm, all right, you're a bit of a jerk. Mm -hmm. But if you say, hey, look, you know, our time's important. I don't want to screw this up for us, you know, that kind of thing. Yes? Um, I had heard about a service, I don't use it, but um, 
if you are a person who likes to work late at night or odd hours, where you can time or send your email out at a specific time. So you just boomerang. Boomerang. There, you know what? I do like automated services to a point, but I don't like when they can break. It's all. It's why uh, speaking of multiple inboxes, why I don't filter Gmail. Because Gmail is a, can be a moving target. Remember when Gmail went from like the one inbox to all of a sudden the social, the promotional, all that, and all of a sudden you got all those emails from the newsletters you followed saying, hey, you might be missing emails from me. Make sure that you go into the promotional thing and move it into the, like I would rather just have separate inboxes. So I have seven email accounts and they're all for different voices. There's my personal email, my <coughs> professional, my, it keeps it simple for me. I know that if I get an email in my personal email account, in, in I use dispatch on the iOS or I use a mailbox on the Mac, I look at it and I go, okay, well, I'm not answering personal email until after five o'clock because that's my personal time. And if I look at the rest of my emails, I have sales, I have info, I have coaching, and I have Mike. Uh, and so I'll look at the Mike ones first because those are relationships that are well established. And I'm also going to answer that in a different voice, right? Coaching, I'm going to answer in a completely different voice and also keep it a little bit on the, the down low because they're coaching clients. Sales, I'll answer that in a sales type voice, right? You know, oh, I'm really sorry that your download didn't work or, oh, thanks for buying, da, 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 da. Info, very more formal because there's no relationship there. But my, I don't have to think as hard about when I'm going through my email inbox, okay, how do I answer this? What voice am I in? Da, 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 da. I just keep all of them separate, no filters, just separate inboxes. I don't combine them all. It just makes things simpler for me. And then if I decide to outsource my sales at some point, I just hand them the keys. If I decide that I'm not going to answer the info of productivity as email, psh, there you go. That's your email account. And I just delete it from, from mailbox and all of a sudden somebody else has the keys to it. So it allows me to answer with multiple voices. It makes it simpler when I want to untether myself from it. I don't know how many of you use separate inbox, separate email accounts for various activities. Yeah, it's smart. Remember, the, 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 it used to be really cool to, oh, we'll filter it all in the one Gmail account. And then trying to untangle that mess is such a huge problem. The other thing we want to do is communicate with the right tools. If we're trying to be productive rather than do productive, tools like Slack are fantastic for communication, threaded communication, S-L-A-C-K. I think it's slackhq.com. Um, is it just slack.com? They, they got it? Good on them. Uh, <laughs> Slack's fantastic. Threaded conversations, all that stuff. The, this thing right here still works. <laughs> the phone. You get vo vocal nuances. You know, I, imagine me trying to coach somebody via email. Oh my God, <laughs> just in text, it wouldn't work. The phone does work and it's immediate, right? And not everybody has your phone number. So you've already filtered it. Text messaging is the same. Social media works the same way. So pick the right tool for the right communication. Before you send an email next time to somebody, that's where you start to think about the other person. Say, does this need to be in an email? Because remember, what you send them is going to come back, right? All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools before we wrap up that I use or that I use to judge what tools I will use, okay? And I call it the SOS productivity tool metric. It's not about apps necessarily. It's about different approaches. So the first one, the first S, and you'll notice SOS, help. We all need help. We can't possibly keep track of everything that we've got going on. So S, well, I'm sure you'll love the first S, simple. So I'm I look for something that's simple, that lessens the learning curve and lowers the barrier to entry. And this also works in organizations as well. So if you're working for a large organization, you're trying to get them out of a tool and into a new one that's more appropriate, the more simple it is, the easier it is for, that, for you to break down that barrier. Slack is a great example of that. Hey, look, we can share everything here. And if you want to share something with a marketing team and this and this and this, People go, wow, that seems really simple. I'll use it, right? Right now, what the tool that seems simplest to people is email because email is a known commodity. So we have to find things that are simple that will work. Task management, whether it's, and paper is super simple, right? Mm -hmm. If I handed you a piece of paper, you would go, well, sorry, this is not compatible with my software. <laughs> I'm not gonna happen. <laughs> It's not going to crash on you either, right? So it's very simple. And, and the other thing is it's obvious in a lot of ways. Paper is going to convey some kind of message. And the tool you use, you want to have as much obviousness as possible. It lessens the choices needed to move forward. So for example, Evernote. Evernote is obvious. It's where notes go. 
In a lot of cases, to me, it's a digital filing cabinet. I know some people have used it as a task management system, much to their peril. <laughs> but I know it's happened. It's not obvious for that. It's obvious for notes, right? And the final S is scalability. You want to make sure it can scale, because scalability lessens the possibility of change as growth occurs. How many times have you like been in one tool and then it, 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 did, it just stopped? Like clear is a great example on iOS. It's just a simple to-do list and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, well I've got projects now and I don't know how to make this into projects. Or reminders on iOS. Or even paper to a certain extent. Paper can scale very well, but what if you're working with multiple people and multiple teams? You can't really use paper for that, right? It scales in other ways, but you want to look at scalability. So SOS, that's what you want. And there are some tools that will definitely help with that. And we're going to get to them as we talk about leveraging your calendar and your clock. Because that's going to help you focus on task over time and start worrying about being productive as opposed to doing productive. So first, capture. Capture is one of the best ways you can start to leverage your time. It sounds weird. What do you mean capture time? No, I mean capture everything. If something comes to your mind, write it down. Paper, digital, take a picture. Do something. Get it out of your head. Don't let it sit there. Because you will not remember it later. Remember, easy doesn't necessarily mean simple in this case. Especially in this case. It's easier not to write it down. Yes, but what about later when you're trying to remember it? How many of you have been writing something down that has nothing to do with the thing that comes out on the piece of paper. If you're writing something like, I'm going to send a letter to my mom by jam, that w what, by jam, what the? You ever had that happen where you're writing something and something that's in your head and subconsciously in there just comes out on the screen or comes out on the piece of paper? <coughs> right? Yeah. It's, we need, it's that noise. I don't know about the rest of you, but I know as I drive, or drive around, I'm looking for an address now. When did I start turning down the radio when I was looking for an address? That never used to bother me. All of a sudden, now I'm like, okay, I gotta look for this thing, turn down the radio. It's in my way. <laughs> the noise. Because your head has lots of things going on in it. Your mind was meant to be a factory, not a warehouse. The more stuff you put in there, the less work it can actually do. You have lower bandwidth. That's why you run out of energy. You keep so much stuff in there. You keep the wrong stuff in there. You think about the email that's sitting in your inbox. Maybe you should respond to it, but I'm not sure if I should respond to it, or maybe it should be a text, or I don't know. Write it down. Capture it. Let your mind do that work. Your mind is the processor. It's not the hard drive. Right? Focus on task, not on time. Again, you can h hold on to tasks in your hand. You can wrap your head around them. And tasks are very subjective. How you treat a task is going to be different than how somebody else does. Right? Time is universal. I mean, yes, we all live in different time zones, which means time is even bigger than it was before. Because if I answer an email at 2 in the morning, my time, it's 5 in the morning out east. So they're like, hey, he's up early. No, I haven't gone to bed yet. So focus on task, not on time. Start shaping your time. This is how you start shaping your time. We worry about getting our bodies in shape. Congratulations, Dan, by the way. That's awesome. Thank you. We're about getting, keeping our minds in shape by reading and educating ourselves. And coming to conferences like this is all about shaping. We should be shaping our time as well. Right? We control how we use our time. But we can only do it, who was the person that mentioned the Covey, Stephen Covey earlier today? Was it, was it uh, Robin, I think, that was here that left? Somebody mentioned yeah. Stephen Covey Apparently that they so. wish they met. Huh? Apparently so. Apparently so. Apparently so. All right. <laughs> so we talk about urgent and important. I know, David, you touched on that too, right? The reason that we end up not being able to control our time or manage our time or shape the time we want is because we let things go to the point where all of a sudden they're urgent. And then, we, then time shapes us. It changes us, right? Where if we focus on task and not on time, it allows us to shape time a lot easier. I know it's popular in the task management world to use start dates instead of due dates. 
How many of you use start dates when you're starting a project in your calendar? You say, hey, it's a milestone I'm going to start, or in your task manager. How many of you use due dates? Raise your hands. How many of you work to the due date and then go, crap, the due date's here, or you see it the week of the catch? <laughs> That's the thing, is that we start to work towards items of urgency. And we're, we should be dealing with items of importance. In fact, one of the things that, that when you think about it, mindset-wise, when you're using a time-based mindset, it forces you to deal with items of urgency. But when you use a task-based mindset, it allows you to deal with items of importance. You can look at the task. You can be critically thinking about it. You can say, hey, how am I going to write that book? How am I going to get that stuff to those... 5,000 kids, see? <laughs> or that's 5,000, 10,000 years. Or, you know, how am I going to you know, put on a great event? How am I going to do that? Because I'm sure you didn't cram everything into the last day here, right? Most the last day. couple of most <laughs> not all, not all the time. Thursday. <laughs> but that's the point. You can't let, you have to shape your time. The only way you can shape your time is by taking care of it, taking care of yourself, managing you and your energy. Patrick's going to hate me for this part. Hyper-scheduling. We had this conversation on a podcast not too long ago. How many of you have seen the movie about a boy? Did you remember when the boy, sh uh, when, uh, w Will, they actually have a TV show now, right? The NBC TV, so they, they've taken the British thing and made it American, which always works. Um, <laughs> so uh, this, this guy, this bachelor confirmed, uh, Made money off of a hit song. I think his dad wrote the hit song, actually. Yeah, yeah, some, yeah, some <laughs> British Santa happy Super birthday Slayer. or something. Yeah. Yeah, what was it called? Santa Super Slayer. Santa Super Slayer. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Cap Everyone We're capture that and don't forget it. Yeah. Um, so he started, so he, and so he had his day worked out to 15 minute increments. Then what happened? The boy showed up. Now, how many of you have kids? Can you time get, huh? Time I was gonna say, they, they, you don't have your day scheduled in 15 minute increments, do you? You might, it's just not gonna work out for you. No, you just have to schedule their day in 15 minutes. Right, 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 yeah, exactly. The thing is, is that when you hyper, what you can do is you end up hyper, if you use your calendar as the task manager, then you can wind up hyper scheduling yourself. You don't leave enough flexibility for things. Speaking of kids, you're right, kids are terrible time managers, but they're excellent task managers. If you try to get a kid ready to go to school in the morning, if you, yeah. what's, what's even worse? So they're playing with something. They're watching. I'm watching a show right now, or I'm doing the playing with my toy. I've got to go to school. No, I don't. Toy. School <laughs> <laughs> starts in 10 minutes. Worse, but, and that's fine, because you can, you know, we're going to school. But when you t start to teach them stuff like how to tie their shoes, and then they're focusing intently on getting the laces right, and you're like, holy crap, we got to go. And you can't, you can't say, hurry up. Like, you can't just you know, tie them. You can't, because that doesn't help. Kids are excellent task managers and terrible time managers, but that also can work if, you're, if you have kids and you want to spend time with them. That also works to your advantage, especially if you're very busy. I have a friend of mine whose wife travels a lot, and what, she, uh, what he suggested she does is say, he says, you know, spend 10 minutes with my son, your son every day when you get home. Just 10 minutes. And more often than not, it's not even 10 minutes that she has to spend because it's the quality of the engagement that matters. And that's exactly what happens when you start to take ownership of the stuff that you're doing too. It's the quality of the engagement that happens, right? Because more often than not, the kids get bored after three minutes. Oh, mom, your daddy life's boring. I'm going to go off and play again. But it's the importance of that connection, right? So, but when you hyper schedule, you put yourself at risk of overwhelming yourself. And to stave off overwhelm, the things that should go in there really are date specific appointments or things that you are having problems doing regularly. Like for me, exercise. I kind of suck at it <clears throat> because I haven't practiced it enough and also I hate it. But <laughs> if I want to do the thing that, that I want to be able to live to be a great grandparent, then I better start doing it, <laughs> right? So what do I have to do? Instead of putting it in my task manager, I schedule it on the calendar for a specific time because I'm making an appointment with myself. And if I break that appointment, 
that it's no different than breaking a point with somebody else. In fact, it might be even worse, right? So the other way we can move things forward, and we talk, I know you talked about roles and, and, and looking at things through different lenses. How many of you heard the term contexts? So contexts are a GTD term. And what they allow you to do is they really ultimately, in layman's terms, they add value to your tasks. So they allow you to work not by project, which is how most brains work. I need to move forward with this book. I need to move forward with this event. And they can say, well, what can I do with where I have, with what I, what I can, with where I am? It's resource based. Now I talked about energy levels, managing time and your energy. I use energy levels as context all the time because I can connect to that very easily. So I can say, hey, this task is high energy. This task is low energy. I can do that. So look at context and try to think outside the box with them. Time chunking is another thing. You make time smaller with time chunking. So schedule blocks of time to work on certain things and be vague about it, okay? Don't say, you know, I'm going to uh, work on Project X. Say, I'm going to have desk time or I'm going to have work time or whatever. Be a little bit more vague about it because then that gives you that flexibility of what you can work on. Again, it requires discipline and willpower. So I have the Green Lantern ring. Uh, well, I, I don't have much time to talk about these, so if you want to ask me what these three Ds are, you already know them. Distraction, ultimately defined as something that you can control, you can mitigate. Your notifications on your phone, that kind of thing. Disruptions are things that happen that really you can't. Fire alarm goes off, we got to leave. Diversion can be the path that both of those lead us down. The way you can stop that is by looking at things by context or through a different lens, or getting back to that plan that, that David was talking about. Looking at something that can snap you back out of it. Some of the quick tools, and I can tell everybody about these later. Very simple, very clean, SOS, Todoist, it's web-based, works on the Mac, works on uh, uh, Android, Windows, web-based, all that stuff. Very clean, very simple. Paper. We <laughs> 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 have no response to that. <laughs> ton of systems, I already touched on them, Bullet Journal, Dash Plus. I have one of my own. You can ask me about it. Uh, David's stuff, which is going to take a while to load because it's not fine in the photo. But David's stuff. Using a multi-pen. Color. If you're starting to use paper, use a multi-pen. Right? It's not geeky anymore to have one of those. Because we're not in school anymore. <laughs> Pomodoro technique. There we go. Very easy to wrap your head around. Eisenhower matrix, Pomodoro technique. I'll, who, who asked what a Pomodoro technique was? Okay, Pomodoro technique, I'll tell you real quick. I, two minutes? Two minutes? Okay. Uh, Pomodoro technique is basically a uh, technique that allows you to break tasks down into 25 minute increments. You work on a task for 25 minutes, then you take a five minute break, then you switch tasks and work uninterrupted on for another 25. Do that four times, take a half hour break after that. And so what that does is allows you to really, it promotes neuroplasticity for one thing. and also allows you to make measured progress on a specific task consistently. And if you finish that first task before the 25 minutes are up, then you can move on to something else. But it's, it's, it's a real quick way. And you set a timer, and there's lots of apps out there that will, will help you with that. Or you just buy a tomato timer for, what is it, like 25 bucks off the Pomodoro Technique site. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the Eisenhower Matrix is, uh, it's not my site. The Eisenhower Matrix is uh, basically that urgent important stuff, the Covey matrix I was touched on. You can use that by day, by project. You know, you can really get your head, use your head to wrap around that. I mean, the president used it to make decisions for crying out loud. Begin your day before bed. That's another simple tool. Journaling is one of the things you can do before bed. Celebrate your failures and your successes. That way you go into the next day, you'll wake up the next day going, what do I have to do? Because email isn't the answer. You provided the answer the night before. Task first, time next. Very simple to wrap, wrap your head around task for time. Effectiveness first, efficiency second. That allows you to get better. Then you get faster. Three things you can do right now. I'll leave these up at the end. Flip the switch on email. If you want to get your inbox under control, put the oldest emails, most visible at the top, and get embarrassed for a little while. And then plow through those. Put your oldest email. Make them the ones. Because remember, first in, first out. Jason Fried, I think, said advice is best served fresh. So is email, really. Uh, build the capture habit, which we've all talked about to a certain extent. And go device or environment specific. Use your phone for phone stuff, communications. Use your iPads or tablets for, for creation and reading and stuff like that. You know? Be intentional about the use of your devices. 
And I will leave that one up there and call it a day. Thanks so much, everybody.